Okay, great. Look, let's get started. Um, I mean, I guess the first question, purely introductory, we, we, you know, you go into as much or as little detail as you want. Um, uh, obviously, I've done my research, but I'm always keen to kind of get an introduction in people's own words, particularly, I, I suppose, with, with a slant to, to how that experience, I mean, yours is extensive, obviously, but I see it goes right back to, you you know, this this early love of computers. You said late 90s, I think it was, something like that. So, I'm always keen to kind of understand how that thread has, has always been there through your career and I guess how it informs your more recent work as a kind of starting point. Sure, sure. How far back do I go? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm a biologist by, by training. Oh, okay. So when I was in university uh, in undergrad, mm. uh, in third year, our professor <clears throat> told us to hand up our third year uh, project on a computer, uh, mm. on, a, on a disc, sorry, on a disc. Mm. And... At the time in the department, there was two computers, mm. and, but they were old Amstrad 1512s, which okay. means nothing to you, but what it means is they had no internal hard drive. Mm. So you had to go along to the machine with three literally floppy drives. They were the five and a quarter inch floppy drives that you right. could actually bend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of them was the operating system. Another was your applications, and the third one was your actual data that you saved on. And the, the uh, computers had two disk drives built in, so you had to be swapping disks in and out. And it was wow. just, it was a nightmare. <laughs> and at the same time, I had worked two summers uh, in the UK, mm. um, and I got a, a check from the HM Revenue Service for two summers of work that I had claimed back the tax I had paid during those summers because I was a student, I, I didn't need to pay tax. So sure. I got this nice big check of two summers worth of work and I got this requirement uh, to do this project on a disk and the facilities in the department were abysmal <laughs> computer-wise. So I said, hmm, why don't I buy myself a computer and, and a book on how to do computers because I had no clue. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I did. I bought a computer and I bought a book and taught myself how to do computers. And that started a kind of love of computers. And then when I, when I went into postgrad in the department, they asked me, would I set up and run a, a training course for the undergrads and how to do mm -hmm. computers? And I said, mm -hmm. sure, no problem. And I did that and had great fun doing it. So then I contacted a couple of local computer companies and said, look, I'm teaching computers to the fourth years in university. Uh, do any of your customers, would they have any requirements for learning computers? And it was computer applications, you know, how to do spreadsheets and, and yeah. Word documents and calculations and graphs and things like that. Yeah, sure. You know, what the fourth years would need who had never seen a computer before because, you know, it, it was that time. It was, you know, mm -hmm. late, it was late 80s, early 90s. It was the start of the 90s, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, 91, 92, and the computer company said, yeah, sure. So they brought me in and I was training their customers on how to do databases and things like that. And then there was a requirement to do uh, software development for some of them. So I brought in some more people, set up a company and made it a business, did software development. And so we were into the mid to late 90s and we were doing uh, what is now known as software as a service. Basically, we were web, web fronting databases. Uh, and then we hit the, the 2000s and uh, we had the kind of dot bomb and in 2002, the company was still going, but it was eking along. And I merged with another company uh, where I went in as CTO, brought the team in with me. And the other company had a software product. It was an access database product. And we wanted to convert it to a software as a service, so web fronted database backend. Uh, it was around ERP. Uh, it was reverse logistics, so got into supply chain and that kind of thing. I stayed with that company for a couple of years. And then in 2004, decided to go at my own again and set up a social media business. So you can see a lot of times it's very kind of leading edge stuff I was doing. Yeah, so I, yeah. did the, I did the software, uh, social, sorry, I did the social media consultancy for four years, 2004 to 2008. Mm. Uh, ran a lot of conferences, did a lot of consulting, that kind of thing. And in 2006, while I was doing that, my uh, the, the the guy who I was doing the software development with, Jerry Sweeney, he and I got back together to uh, co-found a data center. Uh, and because there was eight data centers in Ireland at the time, they were all in Dublin. We were in Cork, so we said Cork needs a data center. Okay. So because I because this was 2006, so I was two years into the social media. I had a strong social media background at this point. 
So I said, well, if we're doing this, we should really open source it. Mm. And this was kind of revolutionary at the time because no one at the time was open sourcing data centers. Data centers were supposed to be extremely proprietary and you would mm. never let anyone know what was going on in your data center because there was all kinds of security implications and blah, blah, blah. And I took the exact opposite approach. And I said, no, no, we open source it. We show everyone exactly what we're doing. And that way, because, because it was Cork, because, you know, a data center could be anything from a comms closet with a rat's nest of cables right through to yep. a Facebook or a Google style data center. We were going to be somewhere in the middle. So if we open sourced it, everyone would see what it was like. We were going to make it hyper energy efficient. So we wanted to show people exactly what we were doing to do that. So it was, uh, we were the first people online to mention cold aisle containment, for example. So we did all that. We opened it. It went really well. It opened for business in 2008. Uh, a few years ago, it was the data center in Europe with the shortest ping time to North America because the Hibernia wow. 1 transatlantic cable pops mm. in there. So it, that went really well. And then in 2008, I moved to Spain for personal rather than professional reasons, which meant I had to drop a lot of the businesses I had in Cork. Okay. Uh, and I needed a job that would allow me to work remotely through English because I didn't speak any Spanish at the time, which was going to be a bit of, a bit of an issue. <laughs> so I got a job as an industry analyst with Red mm-hmm. Monk and I, I headed up the uh, practice within Red Monk, which focused on energy and sustainability and uh, known as Green Monk. So I did that for about seven years uh, and then uh, kind of towards the end of 2015, a couple of companies approached me independently and said, listen, Tom, if you ever think of leaving Red Monk, you know, come and have a chat with us. <laughs> and I, 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 it hadn't occurred to me, but um, I kind of planted a seed. And so I said to the guys in Red Monk, look, I'm, I'm out. I'll work till the end of February and then, then I'm out. Okay. Uh, so I did. And I, I wrote a post on my blog saying I'm leaving Red Monk talking to a number of companies. There's nothing signed yet. So the window's still open for another while if anyone else wants to get in touch. Uh, and a few people did. And I had some really interesting conversations. Uh, one of them was Elon Musk. Uh, and he okay. wanted me to be, in his words, the voice of Tesla. Right. Uh, which was incredibly tempting, as you can imagine. Wow. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But the only thing was he wanted me to move to Palo Alto. Right. Okay. Um, I, I have this beautiful house in just on the outskirts of Seville mm. uh, with beautiful gardens. I have a pool in the back there, sun shining 365, well, 360 days a year, let's say. Uh, you know, <laughs> That's so, enough. <laughs> yeah, and if I wanted something like that in Palo Alto, I actually went on Zillow at the time and, and checked it out. It would have been in the millions, you know? Right. So, okay. Okay. Uh, SAP also reached out to me at the same time. Mm. And uh, I had conversations with SAP and I said, look, I want to stay in Seville. And they said, sure, we don't care where you are. I was like, ooh, that was nice. I said, but I've got my own YouTube channel. I don't want to be starting up a new SAP YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. I've got my own mm-hmm. blog and I've got my own. I said, of course, that's where your audience is. We don't want you to change anything like that. You know, no. wow. it, was all, it was all tick, 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 you know. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And so I said, <laughs> okay, sign me up. So I joined, <laughs> I joined SAP in, in 2016, in September, uh, as an IoT evangelist. Mm. And um, then there was a reorg within SAP where the IoT organization internally was given to another team. Mm -hmm. So I said to my manager, look, the stuff I've been talking about isn't just IoT. It's the whole suite of products around Mm. IoT because nobody comes up to us and says, can I have an IoT, please? You know, it's it's not a thing. The Mm. IoT doesn't work in isolation. So I said, I'm talking about this whole innovation suite anyway. So why don't I, I can't really be talking, I can't really call myself an IoT evangelist now because that's another team's responsibility. But why don't I change my title to innovation evangelist? And he said, that sounds like a good idea. So I went on to LinkedIn, edited my profile to say innovation evangelist, opened up Outlook, went into the signatures, changed my email signature to say innovation evangelist. And suddenly I was an innovation evangelist for SAP. It's that easy. <laughs> <laughs> it was literally that easy. That and, and futures because I'm, you know, a lot of the thread of what I've been doing throughout my entire career has always mm. been bleeding edge or leading edge stuff. Yeah. Uh, everything from doing the software as a service back in the late uh, 90s right through to uh, the data center right through to IoT and energy the kind of stuff I was talking about in the late in, in kind of 2008 <clears throat> I was talking about IoT and energy and smart grids and stuff like that the kind of stuff that's only coming to fruition now mm-hmm. so it's, it's always been that so that's, that's, that's where that comes from 
I think what's you know what's fascinating with that is and, and rightly yeah you know it, it's always leading edge you always seem at the forefront that's only a, a I guess what a, a 20 30 year span I mean you are a, a, an innovation evangelist but I mean if you look at that period and and I guess we can come on to how innovation and technology has impacted organizations and us individually but are you sometimes surprised with with the pace of that change over over that period Yes and no. It, it, it's, yeah. it's one of these things, you know, where people say it goes slowly, 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 and then mm. you look back mm. and you go, oh, wow, that happened really quick. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> and it, 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 there's a lot of that there. Um, I, I get frustrated often at the pace because it's so slow. And then, like I say, okay. I look back and it's like, whoa, um, you know, smartphones. I mean, it, it's now 13 years since mm. the iPhone was launched. Mm. Um, and I remember my, my phone immediately before uh, an iPhone was an Nokia N95, which was mm-hmm. state of the art. <laughs> and then I got uh, an iPhone. Now, I didn't get the first iPhone. I got the second one, the, the 3G one. Okay. That was the, the iPhone 3, whatever. I, I got that one. And that had a, a, a fault in its design. Right. Uh, which meant that sometimes the plastic back of it used to crack. And mm-hmm. sure enough, it happened mine, and I rang Apple support, and they said, oh, that's covered under warranty. And I was like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so send it back to us, we'll fix it, and we'll, we'll, send, you a, a, uh, we'll send you back the repaired one. Mm-hmm. Said, Great, so I did, I sent it back to them, but of course, I still needed a phone. So I had to go back to the N95. And I was like, oh my God, this is like going back to green screen <laughs> computing. It's like, yeah, oh, it, get it's, my iPhone. It's, you, you were remembering those floppy disks oh, from years yeah. ago. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, so the, and, and, and that's just, two, I know 2008, sound 2009 mm-hmm. sounds like an eon ago. It's a decade ago mm-hmm. or more. But just that change, the change from the N95 to the iPhone happened quite quickly. And it happened, sure, I, I, I remember uh, going to a building here in Spain uh, and I needed to talk to someone inside the building, a security guard there. So I, I, I called up the person inside the building from my iPhone and said, look, you need to talk to the security guard, let me let him in. Mm-hmm. So I handed the security guard the phone and he said, what's this? And then I said, it's a phone. And he said, it's not a phone. <laughs> yes, it is a phone. He said, There's no buttons on it. <laughs> Literally, that conversation <laughs> happened in 2009. Wow. You know, so, but the world has changed so much. No one had smartphones in, not yeah. no one, but maybe 1% of the population, <clears throat> us tech nerds, had smartphones in 2007 with the, like, the E65 and the N95 and those kind of ones. Mm. But the, the iPhone came along and suddenly everyone had smartphones. Within five years, everyone had a smartphone. Everyone knew how to use them. And sure. that completely changed technology because then you had Twitter and then you had Facebook. And, you know, I'd be walking around the neighborhood here and suddenly I'd hear my neighbors saying, <laughs> saying Twitter and saying Facebook. And I'm like, hang on a second. These aren't nerds. These aren't tech yeah. people. How, how, what? And, it, it, you know, suddenly everyone got into tech and mm. suddenly everything became tech. And Mark Andreessen wrote his seminal a blog post uh, that software is eating the world. And it's absolutely true. I mean, again, you look at the smartphone and how many devices have turned into mm-hmm. software. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, the, the video recorder, the audio recorder on the, the iPhone, you no longer need separate hardware devices for these. You know, so many other things uh, have been, you know, turned into software yeah. and and that the, the pace of that happening has been absolutely unbelievable sorry my dog was barking away in the background there <laughs> let me just go on pause for a second yeah yeah sure okay there's someone at the door I think, I think it, <laughs> is that okay I don't know, I, I, I can still hear the dog but anyway we, we'll, we'll if you need to go, it's it's no problem if you want to pause. No, it's not to look after it. I just wanted to make sure the dog didn't appear in the recording. Okay. Um, I mean, it, it, from a from an enterprise or an organizational perspective, so so you know, typically digital transformation of companies of organizations is is our focus, our overriding narrative, I guess. I mean, if if you you've talked, I guess. I suppose we could say from a more sort of consumer-led uh, side there about mobile phones, but albeit it bleeds into organizations and enterprise. I mean, what would you say has really been the kind of key driving force for, for companies, for businesses, for, for global multinationals 
in terms of you know the, the accelerating pace of digital transformation is is there one technology is it is it that broader sentiment about how we as individuals use technology or it, it is several things like that yeah mm. so it so because everyone has become computer literate mm. Mm. that has been a big driver in the in the switch to in, in the digital transformation of organizations yeah that and i mean i hate to use the term millennials but you know people who are what millennials are what from let's say 20 to 40 that kind of ballpark i think uh, or, or close enough anyway um and that generation of people who grew up with smartphones mm. uh, and who are extremely computer literate and who expect their organizations to be computer literate. Yeah, yeah. Who expect them to be, to be like, you know, to expect, they expect their computer applications to be like the Facebook that they use every day or Twitter or, or TikTok or whatever it is. Uh, so if it's not, then the organizations are going to have a problem with retention. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember, you know, 10 years ago or more, uh, companies trying to decide whether or not they'd have a blog, whether or not they'd allow their employees to blog, whether or not they'd allow their employees even further back, whether or not they'd allow their employees to have an email address. Yeah. You know, this kind of ri- these kind of ridiculous conversations. <laughs> uh, and they, they actually happened, you know. Should we allow them on social media? Literally, w- they would put a block on the firewall on the likes of YouTube and uh, all the other social media sites. And mm. you're thinking to yourself, are you insane? <clears throat> are you absolutely insane? These, these, these people are going to go to the next company that doesn't have that block there, you know. Yeah. And, 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 and more than that, you're, you're, you're stopping them talking. Uh, mm-hmm. Because if you allow them to talk and to talk favorably about you as an organization, you know, then it's great. Whereas Absolutely. If, if, if it's like putting, so this is an analogy which might not, might, might not make sense to a lot of people, but there, there used to be phones with rotary dials on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had one for me when I was young. Yeah, I remember. There you go. There you go. There you go. So there used to be these phones with rotary <laughs> dials on them, which, yeah. which, were, which we put them in front of people today and they wonder how they work. <laughs> there was an ability to put a little padlock on these so people couldn't use the phone. You know. So I used to tell organizations, if you are stopping your employees from using social media, it's like putting a phone on their desk with a rotary mm-hmm. dial and a padlock on the dial that they can't talk out. It's insane. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, for, from a recruitment and retention point of view, if you're not, if your company isn't, you know, digitally savvy, you're not going to recruit and you're not going to retain these people. So just that alone is a huge yeah. driver of digital transformation. And then. We've seen along comes COVID-19 and that Mm. has been an incredible kick in the ass for a lot of organizations. Mm. Um, So I I saw on Twitter a couple of memes being tweeted around this and one of them was one of these kind of polls, you know, uh, the the thing that was most responsible for our uh, digital transformation was A, our CEO, B, our CFO, C, our CIO, D, ticked COVID-19, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I'm sure lots of people have seen that. And it, it's actually been the case because particularly I work within the supply chain organization in SAP and okay. uh, we have see, we, we put out very early on, we put out uh, three free offers for our customers to stand up uh, cloud-based solutions to help them make their supply chains more resilient. Mm-hmm. And of course, in, in a time like this, when there's massive disruption and rolling disruptions happening as lockdowns mm. appear in different places at different times, supply chains are incredibly fragile. And supply chains sure. have been designed to be extremely lean in the last number of years. They've been optimized for maximum mm. leanness, which is obviously also optimizing for maximum fragility, mm-hmm. uh, which is, you know, when you have times like this, it's a disaster. Literally, yeah. yeah. Um, so we stood up these these offers for our customers, and they bit our hands off because we were they were cloud delivered, so they didn't have to instantiate a, a data center. Mm. Uh, and we worked with our partners to help with rollout, uh, and so we we couldn't believe the uptake on these products, and it was because people needed to get visibility. 
and resilience into their supply chains because okay. so much disruption was happening and, and a lot of people were scrambling because they didn't know what was going on within their own supply chains. Mm. So, yeah, that's been a huge, huge influencer on, on the digitization of, of supply chains in this case, but organizations in general, I think. Do, do you think that, I mean, you know, I- the amount of times I've said the, the, the phrase the new normal to people over the last few weeks. We <laughs> it's count unprecedented, new, is it? Many, many <laughs> hands. Um, but I mean, the, the, the sense I get from, from talking to other companies certainly is, is you know, that this really will fundamentally change the way that organizations view their technology, I guess their digital strategies, and, and perhaps as well the technologies that, that they choose to adopt. Um, yeah. I mean, do, do, do you think that that's the case? And, and really, it's almost a case of digital strategy, technology before and, and after are, are just going to be completely different? Or, or Yeah, I think so. I think a lot of organizations who hadn't uh, really seriously considered cloud are now thinking cloud. Mm-hmm. I, I think a lot of organizations in terms of digital transformation who, you know, were maybe dipping their toe in the water, they maybe mm-hmm. had a proof of concept, they maybe they maybe had one aspect of their organization that had a digital something. Mm-hmm. I think they're now going, oh, we've got to go full on for this digital transformation and we've got to make everything as digital as fast as possible. Yeah. The other the other big thing, if we think of manufacturing organizations, um, they have a huge, some of them have a huge issue right now. And that is that a lot of manufacturing lines, for example, have not been optimized, have not been designed for physical distancing of its line workers. Okay. And that presents significant issues to the manufacturers because if they can't have the same number of people on the line, then they can't have the same throughput on the mm-hmm. line that they normally would have. And so the orders are still coming in. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you think of maybe, a, we've seen a lot of outbreaks in, in, in food uh, manufacturing lines, meat plants and things like that, for yeah. example. And that that's a huge issue. And people still need to eat, so the orders are still coming through. So to try and keep the output the same as before, mm with fewer people on the line, you only have a few choices. The choices are you increase the number of, you increase the number of hours that the lines are up. So maybe Mm -hmm. if they weren't 24 seven, now you make them 24 seven, you put on extra shifts or you add add in extra lines, uh, which may be a possibility if you have more space and you can get the machinery to do it, or you increase the automation on the lines. And this last one is the one that is probably the one that is most likely to be able to be done because a lot of these plants are going to be 24-7 anyway. Uh, A lot of them uh, don't have the space to add in an extra line. Maybe they can't get access to the machinery, but a lot of it's about space for lines. Okay. Uh, So they can't do that safely. So this is going to lead to, in a lot of manufacturing uh, situations, a huge requirement to add automation into their lines so that they can now have the same output, but with fewer people, more physically distant. So right. that, that, that's going to be a, a, a big um, trend we'll see in the next two years at least. Uh, and it is, we're looking at a two-year window because, you know, there's no scientist out there who's saying we'll have a vaccine before Christmas. Sure. You know, yeah, it's yeah. going gonna, gonna to be, it's going to be 18 months. And even when it is, people are going to be prioritized. So the first people to get it will be doctors and nurses. Second people will to, mm-hmm. to get it will be people in care homes, either mm-hmm. the workers or the residents. Next people to get it will be people who work in public facing jobs, you know, and so on and so on and so on. So mm-hmm. it, it's going to be prioritized that way on, on a country by country basis. And so we're looking at two years. We really are in, in reality. And so there's no manufacturing organization that can say, to itself, well, we'll wait two years and then we'll decide to increase our, our output. No, that, that can't happen. So yeah, they'll, yeah. they'll have to increase their, their automation. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's uh, an incredible uh, time, uh, but it's also, I guess, from a technology perspective, uh, an exciting time, uh, you know, God forbid, all the terrible <laughs> things that have happened. Um, but I mean, it, it, from, from a perspective of an evangelist, someone like yourself who's always at the bleeding edge. I mean, it must, it must raise some very exciting questions, you know, to see a, a kind of forced accelerated shift of, of technology adoption. I mean, did, did, do you see that, 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 that you know, that, that two-year period will condense 
a vast amount of time and, and you know, yeah. two years away, three years away, things will be noticeably different in terms of new technologies adopted. Absolutely. I mean, it, like I said, companies yeah, yeah. are going to need to roll out these solutions fast. Mm. Uh, uh, in order to survive because the, the, the kind mm. of expression I'm hearing lots of times is survive and thrive. Mm. Uh, the, the first order of business is survival and then thriving. Uh, mm. And, you know, the, the kind of solutions that are out there, and I'm, I'm not trying to push, you know, I, I know I'm an SAP evangelist and I should be saying, we have solutions to help customers with this. So do most other technology companies, you know? Yeah. So, uh, I'm not going to say we're any better than any others. Okay, I am. We are better than everyone else. But <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you say that. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, we're all, all of us, ourselves uh, and our partners and mm. even our competitors, we're all there and we're all doing our best to help all of our customers because we have to, because mm. this is a survive mode for a lot of companies right now. Mm. Um, you know, for companies who, who are hitting real difficulties in terms of their supply chains, in terms of meeting their customers' demands, in terms of not having customer demands, mm. uh, you know, that's scary too. And the, if you think, you know, hotels, for example, airlines, people like that, airlines are in a, in a funny one because in, in, a, in a lot of airlines, when they're flying passengers from one country to another, in the in the, in the bottom of the plane, in the top of the plane, they have the passengers. In the bottom of the plane with the luggage, they also have cargo. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now that there's no passengers above, they can do cargo still. Yep. So cargo space in planes is actually becoming premium. So a lot of airlines have lost their passenger business or have lost a significant portion of it, but their cargo business is starting, you know, it's going through the roof. They, they don't have mm -hmm. enough cargo space to meet the demands. And a lot mm -hmm. of that is down to getting medical stuff from say China to Europe or China to wherever the local outbreak is, that kind of thing. So it's, it's a weird time in terms of demand. The fluctuations in demand are just crazy right now. Yep. And that's going to continue to be the case as we see rolling waves of, of, of the pandemic go up and down and appear somewhere else and, and that either hits demand or it hits supply. Uh, everything is in flux and will continue to be for a good time yet. And I guess, you, you know, drawing it back to, to, to the iPhone and, and talking about us as consumers, I guess it's no different for us individually either, right? So, so for example, I, I, I do a lot of work in financial services and fintechs and, and you know, things that are on the rise are, are digital payments, obviously, uh, you know, the, the, the absolute acceleration towards a cashless society and things like that. I, I mean, I guess as individuals as well, something like a, a COVID will, will, will change how we interact with, with technology and, and how we use technology, which in turn, will enterprises have to kind of also shift to, to allow for that change in consumer behavior or... I mean, I guess so. Uh, I mean, the, the the biggest shift I see happening at a consumer level at this rate is the um, the 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 like to the contact tracing apps that are. Mm. Mm. Um, we delivered. I want to say we SAP delivered the the one in Germany, uh, mm -hmm. which was rolled out last week and had 13 million downloads in the first few days, which was incredible. Given uh, German society wow. is one yeah. that is very very conscious of privacy. And mm -hmm. part of the reason that that did so well was because we developed it uh, and uh, we developed it in a very transparent manner. Uh, all of the code for the app was put up on GitHub uh, mm -hmm. and has been the whole development, the whole development process has been available on GitHub as it has been developed over the last number of weeks. Yep. Uh, so everyone could see uh, how... Uh, how, how transparent it was, the fact that you don't need to give an email address to download it and use it. You don't need to register, sign up, anything like that. It just works. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in, in terms of consumers, to go back to your question, that's the only real um, big impact on consumers that I'm going to see right now in terms of technology mm. uh, that COVID is going to bring. I mean, there's other uh, more straightforward things like the, the implications on local supply chain. I mean, if I go to my, if I go to my grocery store's website to order groceries online uh, and I'll order them, Often now, when the delivery comes, uh, the specific brand that I ask for won't be available, but they'll give me an equivalent from another uh, company. So, yep. you know, 
is that a big deal? No, it's not. You know, I, I still get the, the uh, let's say it's the local Cruz Campo beer that I've ordered. Maybe it's San Miguel comes instead or something like mm-hmm. that. You know, that kind of thing. Not, not a big deal. Those kind of things are, are going to be, again, rolling and happening at a consumer level for some time. But it's not really a technology implication of that. And I don't see enterprises having to adapt to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the contract tracing one is going to be one. And maybe... I mean, th- th- that has been developed in close conjunction with Apple and Google. There are very, there are almost no privacy implications there. You don't sign up, as I say. So, uh, and that'll depend from country to country because the German one, we developed it. It's open source. Anyone, any other country can go and download the code, modify mm-hmm. it, and roll it out to their own citizens if, if that's what they desire. Um, so it's, that's possible that they could do one that is equally hands off in terms of, of privacy, uh, whether they will or not. I mean, we saw the UK government trying to do a centralized one because mm. it'd be nice to get everyone's information. Ha ha ha. Yes. We've got all your information now, suckers. Um, you know, Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you have GCHQ advising on a contact tracing app, you want to be worried. Uh, yeah. So they, they had to back off that cause they couldn't get it to work and go the decentralized model, whether they'll use anything that we developed. I'm not sure. Uh, the code is all there if they want it. Mm. Um, we'll see. Um, go on. No, no, no. Uh, please carry on. You know. <laughs> um, no, I was just going to say um, the the. I don't. I don't see a huge. Uh, apart from the contact tracing, I don't see a huge consumer influence of COVID on on our on consumer technology adoption. I mean, we're all there. We all have the smartphones. We yeah. all have the tablets. They all have the at least most second most recent or if not most recent version of the OS for them. Uh, if, mm-hmm. if it's an iPhone, you're probably on iOS 13. Um, in, in, in the Apple environment, people tend to update their OSs pretty much as soon as the new OS comes out or within the following mm-hmm. six months. Uh, in Android, it can be a little slower uh, depending on the manufacturer. But yeah, we're all there with pretty much up-to-date OSs on our devices, uh, pretty much the latest apps that, that have come out. Uh, we have those too, whether it's TikTok or Instagram or mm-hmm. you know whatever, whatever the latest apps we're using are. Um, so in terms of uh, enterprises responding to that, there, there isn't a huge change I see happening on the consumer front. So I, I don't think there's a huge thing there for enterprises to respond to. Okay. Um, I mean, just, just weaving back into that digital transformation thread, um, uh, obviously it kind of underpins your work at SAP, uh, you know, helping organizations realize innovation, technology, and technology adoption, I guess. Um, I mean, I was just keen to explore that a little bit more uh, at a sort of more granular level to, to how it works. Um, particularly, I guess... Actually, sorry, just, just to go back to your previous question, yeah. so, something just did occur to me. Um, the whole gig economy is going mm. to be deeply, deeply, deeply affected by COVID-19. Okay. Um, if you think of Airbnb or mm. Uber or any of these, uh, I mean, would you go to a house of a stranger not knowing how well it had been cleaned before you got there. Right, uh, yeah, yeah. Or would you rent out your house to uh, strangers not mm-hmm. knowing, you know, if they had COVID or not? Uh, similarly with Uber, even more so with Uber, because, you know, the Uber drivers are picking up people, you know, five, six mm. times an hour. Mm. Um, so that's a lot of interactions. And any one of those people they pick up could be infected or the driver themselves could be infected. Would you get into an Uber car not knowing who had been there before you or not knowing how uh, healthy the, the driver was? So in, in that kind of situation, yeah, I can see how that would have an implication on consumers. Uh, how enterprises respond to that, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure it's within their remit, I guess, or Mm. or area of responsibility. Um, Hotels are going to be playing this up and, you know, talking about how how they are far more uh, um, able to uh, showcase their uh, uh, cleaning of rooms Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. I I presume Mm -hmm. they'll probably get some kind of certification to show that, uh, kind of an ISO certification or something, who knows. Already, the airlines are talking about uh, how their uh, staff are all going to be in PPE, how their uh, uh, air 
con units all have HIPAA filters, yep. uh, how they sterilize, you know, they, they're all sending out those emails right now to prospective customers. So th th those kind of things are happening and that, that will continue happen to happen. So, so just taking it back to those, those companies, enterprises, organizations that, that you SAP help to adopt technology, realize innovation. Um, I mean, on, on that, that, that journey, that digital journey, uh, what do you think of the kind of core aspects of, of doing that successfully? What are the main, I'm interested to understand what the main kind of pinch points or challenges are for businesses or, or any trends that perhaps you think more broadly businesses tend to not always be the most effective uh, at realizing. <clears throat> so every, obviously every business is in a unique and individual situation, mm. uh, be it in terms of its supply or its demand or in terms mm. of its uh, country that it's in, that it's based in or countries of its many. Uh, so everyone's in their own unique situation with their own unique IT environment. Mm. So uh, the first thing they have to do is look at what they already have. Mm -hmm. uh, look at what the pinch points are in their whatever, uh, if, it, if they're looking at supply chain, uh, look down through that and see where they have the biggest problems right now and what are the mm -hmm. ones that have the, you know, in terms of lowest hanging fruit in terms of easy to fix. Um, so. There's, there's going to be a lot of those kinds of conversations happening in organizations to say, okay, look, we have got all these problems right now, mm -hmm. which are the ones that we can take off most easily uh, with a digital solution. And, okay. and, and if we can pick four or five top ones, is there any one organization that can hit all five of, of, of those, you know, and maybe we do them one at a time, see how it goes. Mm -hmm. But then at the end of it, we have an integratable set of solutions so you know it, it would be ideal if you have if you if you source them from companies that can hit five or six of your solutions rather yep. than getting five or six companies because then you have a whole mess of trying to get everything to talk to to each other so uh, it there have been a lot of people uh, scrambling and they will continue i guess for a while but uh it, it's it's about um sitting down and drawing up a plan, mm. a, a plan for an integrated series of solutions that can address the many problems or the many pinch points that are there and will continue to be there as we see uh, massive fluctuations and swings in supply and in demand for organizations and regulatory changes as well because we're seeing regulatory responses, be it, the, be it something very straightforward like the requirement to wear masks mm -hmm. or maybe changing requirements in terms of hotels or changing requirements in terms of uh, taxis or you know any of the other kind of things like requirements in terms of uh, manufacturing to have physical distancing in place, requirements mm -hmm. in terms of reporting of physical distance, because that's going to be a thing too. If you're a manufacturing yes. organization, uh, you will be required to have physical distancing in place, but you'll also be required to have solutions in place for monitoring and recording and reporting breaches of that in the same way that OSHA regulations today mandate that organizations have to record and uh, report uh, incidences on site and have uh, responses in place to make sure those kind of things don't happen again. Okay. That kind of thing will, will include uh, physical distancing and breaches of those and uh, reports on how to ensure it doesn't happen again as well. So there's, there's all kinds of things like that, that companies will have to, first of all, those regulations will come out and they'll come out in different places at different times and in different ways but organizations mm. will need to have solutions that, that are able to adapt to those and respond to them and record and report on them as are required in different countries at different times and in different ways. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I mean, more broadly, Tom, I'm just getting a bit conscious we're coming up to the hour. Have you, have you got a hard stop at, at five? Um, I, let, me, let me check my calendar here. I should know this off the top of my head. <laughs> no, but I, I, it's I, fine. I, 
I think I can go. Yeah, no, I can go long. I can, no problem. Okay, well, I don't want to keep you too much longer anyway. I, I, I guess for, from a, perhaps a, a more broad perspective, we, we've touched on a few technologies, um, automation, cloud, you, you, you've touched on, we've, we've talked briefly about IoT. Um, AI, uh, something that, that obviously I've seen you talk about in some of your other videos, are particularly interesting, you, you're talking about AI having a renaissance uh, of, of sorts, and yeah. I know that that's probably a, a common theme that, that you talk a lot about, but I guess I was keen to kind of pick your brains as, as, as to understand more about why you think that is and, and, and where you see AI solutions, I guess, bringing the most value uh, in that sort of overall solution package that, you, that you're talking about to help businesses navigate challenges. Okay, <clears throat> so... Yeah, I think I think automation and AI are kind of uh, two sides of the same coin. Mm. Uh, a, a lot of automation requires a lot of AI, uh, mm. and so uh, the the kind of automation and AI that we would see in manufacturers, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, is going to be hugely important, as I mentioned, for reasons yep. of physical distancing, but there are other things there as well. Um, if we think of the automotive sector, for example, uh, they are being massively disrupted right now. Okay. Uh, there's what's called the CASE megatrends, and CASE stands for Connected Autonomous Shared Services and Electric. And uh, in terms of connected, let's say something like 80% of vehicles now when they ship are connected. Uh, you know, they've got a built-in SIM card. Uh, a lot of them ship with apps. So I have an app on my phone. I can turn on the air con in my car and things like that. All those kind of things remotely. All those kind of things are now happening. But the connectivity in cars uh, is going to lead to things like uh, connected insurance. Mm -hmm. So it has other, all kinds of other implications as well. Uh, your insurance today is flat rate based on stats, essentially. Um, and it makes no sense because, for example, I drive 10,000 kilometers a year. My neighbor drives about 30,000 and we pay roughly the same insurance. That, mm -hmm. makes, that makes zero sense. Uh, but uh, the, the shift to connected vehicles means the insurance companies will be able to know how many kilometers you're driving. And mm -hmm. so do a per kilometer based insurance. And so suddenly my insurance drops in price relative to my neighbors because I'm only driving a third as much. Mm -hmm. Then there's the ability of connected vehicles to tell the insurance company, with your permission, tell the insurance company how you're driving. Are you braking hard? Are you accelerating hard? Are you cornering hard? You know, all these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And that's called pay how you drive. The first one is pay as you drive. The second one is pay how you drive. Mm -hmm. So those kind of business model changes are happening. Uh, there's a lot of AI obviously involved in those. Um, but those kind of business model changes are huge. Um, now, in, in my case, my car is an electric car. And I don't know how much you know about electric cars, but they are fast. And so, yeah. uh, although I drive 10,000 kilometers a year, uh, my insurance should come down if I do pay, uh, you know, as you drive. But unfortunately, I tend to have a very heavy foot. So if I, if I bring out pay how you drive, my grades are starting to go back up again. So it's, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, you know, it, 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 it's, that's not going to work out too well for me. It, it'll stay about the same, unfortunately, but maybe I'll learn how to drive a little more safely. <laughs> but Going back to the automotive industry and, and AI, uh, the connected vehicles, yeah, that, that's one aspect and that's, that's happening more and more. But the electrification of transportation mm. is going to be <clears throat> massively disruptive and will require car companies to roll out massive amounts of automation internally mm. because they are being so disrupted. And the whole, if you think of the supply chain of car manufacturers today, it yep. is unbelievably complex because... The drivetrain of an internal combustion engine vehicle has got in order in, in the order of 2,000 moving parts. Mm. Many of those are not manufactured by the automotive company. They are bought in from suppliers. Yep. Now, the shift to the electrification of transportation means that electric drivetrains have around 20 moving parts, two orders of magnitude less parts required mm by the car manufacturer. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot of suppliers that are in trouble right there. I would not like right. to be a manufacturer of spark plugs <laughs> now because mm. that business is, is dead. It's gone. They just haven't realized it yet. Dead man walking. Mm. Uh, and, and even brake, uh, brake, 
pads because electric vehicles use their brakes far less because yeah. they use regenerative braking. Yeah. So the amount of times you change your brake pads falls. So manuf- the, the whole manufacturing supply chain of uh, automotive uh, companies is going to be hugely disrupted, uh, which has massive implications for the manufacturing, the automation. They got to get the prices down uh, mm-hmm. to, to compete with the EV companies that are already out there and who are already kicking their ass. Um, mm-hmm. Then there's a shift to uh, the uh, autonomous vehicles and that's massively disruptive as well. Oh, one other thing about electrification, the batteries in electric vehicles last forever. They are not like the batteries in your phone or the batteries in your laptop, which die after you know X hundred cycles of charging. The ones in electric vehicles go on for thousands of charges. Yeah. Uh, so, if if we if we take the data from Tesla today, for example, the batteries in their Model S and X and three typically uh, lose roughly one percent of capacity every thirty thousand kilometers driven. Okay. So after wow. 300,000 kilometers, they're still at 90% of original capacity. That's amazing. Now, I don't know how many cars you've ever driven or how many you've ever driven over 300,000 kilometers, but I suspect the answer is quite low. Yeah. Um, and if you think that the modern batteries that are coming out today and in the next couple of years, they're actually far better than that. The new batteries that are coming out today have a battery lifetime in excess of a million miles, not kilometers, but miles. So we're talking 1.6 to 2 million kilometers of of a useful life. And then they're Mm -hmm. still at 80% of original capacity, well, 80 to 90%, in fact, of original capacity. And so they're still extremely useful, but they have third party uses in things like power grids where they can be used for storing renewable energy. So but it just going back to a battery that lasts, call it a million miles. Uh, yeah. A, a cattle, CATL, the Chinese company recently announced 1.2 million miles, but let, let's keep it at around a million miles, 1.6 million kilometers. Mm-hmm. No one will ever drive that or very few people will drive that amount in their lifetime. So now you're buying a battery with a car sitting on top of it the body of the car will last five to 10 years. The battery will last a hundred years. Okay. So the business wow. model changes completely. You are now buying the battery and you're swapping the top. You know, every five to 10 years, yeah. they'll take the top off and put a new top on it and you'll get new upholstery, new software, but the same battery underneath it. Mm-hmm. No one is talking about this as a potential business model, but if you have a million mile battery, what other way would you do it? Yeah. And that changes wow. completely the manufacturing and the business model. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and would you even buy it? Why not just pay, you know, 100 euros a month mm. for access to one of these? The manufacturer continues to own them. Right now, um, GM, for example, GM say that a GM vehicle, when they sell it, they earn $30,000 over the lifetime of the vehicle, not from the sale, but in after sales, from maintenance, from repairs, from you know service, all mm-hmm. this kind of thing. But of course that 30,000 will shrink because if it's an EV, there's far less maintenance required on an EV. Mm-hmm. Uh, as cars get cleverer, as you add more smarts into them, they crash less often, or that's the hope anyway. And okay. so there's far less repairs to be done. Uh, and as, as they become fully autonomous, and then they don't mm-hmm. crash at all. And the, of course, the, the, the battery lasting a million miles means the amortization of them is over a million miles now instead of 150,000 miles today. Mm. So the, the 30,000 shrinks down to close to zero. But of course, if GM doesn't sell the car, and that's their aim with their Maven product, they're going to keep the cars and use them as an autonomous taxi fleet. So similar to Uber, except no driver. They have no mm-hmm. driver to pay. Uh, the, the battery costs negligible to charge because it's electricity, which is far cheaper than petrol or diesel uh, per, per mile driven. The car will last a million miles. So mm-hmm. the, the, the write-off of it is over 100 years as opposed to 10 years or five years. So it, it, the cost of transportation comes down to close to zero. And yet the vehicle will last 10 to 100 years. So now it's earning them 
you know, a hundred dollars a day for, you know, for 365 days for a hundred years. And so that 30,000 that it would have made them in the past becomes 40 or 50 or 60 or 70,000 over the lifetime of the vehicle. So sh completely shifting business models. And I don't know if GM are going to go ahead and do it, but someone is. And, you know, we're going to see lots of the big car manufacturers of today disappear. Uh, the same way we saw Kodak and Blockbuster disappear in the last decade, in the 2020s and 2030s. Uh, it could be Ford, it could be BMW, it could be yep. GM. Some of these will not survive unless they are willing and able to change their business models to take on this new reality. It, it shows you the, 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 the delicate balance of, of technology disruption, right? Yeah. Because... Uh, on the one hand, you, you look at it as, as we do, you know, you, you work ingrained in technology and we write about it and, and you see the opportunity, but the flip side of it is, is equally as bad if you're looking at the levels. It's, it's a real delicate balance that, that I guess it is, is difficult it's, to, to get right. It's, it's Darwinian. And, you know, we've mm. seen in nature, Darwinian evolution is vicious. It can be. Species die off naturally mm. long before we came along <laughs> killing <laughs> or ki sorry ki killing off species long before we were doing that nature was doing it darwin darwinian theory was doing it and that's happening in business now as well and it's 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 just as vicious it's just as you know unmerciful and mm. like i said we saw the examples with with blockbuster and kodak yeah. just they were huge names and suddenly they were no more and that is going to continue to happen and uh, like i say in the automotive industry unless these companies you know unless they're willing to change and they're mm. not they're not being as nimble today as they should be herbert dies who is the uh, ceo of volkswagen said a couple of weeks ago and this was interesting he said that volkswagen needs to, to become a software company and some, wow. some, some right. of his pronouncements have been very positive uh, now i know volkswagen you know have <clears throat> certain reputational issues, shall we say. So the, they, they, they seem, though, to be looking on this as uh, an opportunity, the old Churchillian expression of never waste mm -hmm. a, a good mm -hmm. crisis. So they seem to be adopting that, that um, mantra, which is great. Uh, but some of the other incumbents are less quick to move. And, mm -hmm. you know, you've got to fear for their future if they don't. So, I mean, looking at the future, um, Obviously, we, we've painted a, 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 an equally exciting and, and perhaps terrifying uh, <laughs> prospect, depending on what side of the fence you work on. I mean, if, if you're looking at, uh, from a technology perspective, from an innovation perspective, what, what do you see as, as being the next step change, really? Is there, is there one technology? Is there one trend? You mentioned connected vehicles, for example. Mm. Is, is 5G uh, edge computing going, going to really enable that step change? Is there any one thing on your radar? No, there's lots of things. I mean, yeah. th th there's lots of different technologies. Y you, you're right to point to 5G. That's going to be hugely transformative. And then we'll have 6G and then 7G. And then, you know, and they, they will all be transformative. 5G is going to be huge because uh, it, it's low latency, high bandwidth. We'll have the, the likes of Starlink as well with their low latency, high bandwidth, global mm. internet connection. Uh, so there's, there's lots of those kind of things. AI is going to be huge because it's going to make things just happen frictionless lead sure. that's a word <laughs> yeah <laughs> it is now. um you know uh, uh we're, we're seeing very basic forms of ai at the moment i mean mm -hmm. i've got an iphone i lift it up to my face it recognizes my face and it unlocks that's ai yeah right, right. there yeah you know uh siri okay not not the best example but that's ai <laughs> but you, you go to amazon and their book recommendations are Okay, no longer book recommendations, but it started off mm. as book recommendations. Now they're recommendations for stuff to you to buy. Mm. That's all AI driven as well. You know, so AI is 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 becoming um, what's the word ubiquitous. It's mm. becoming completely ubiquitous, but it's also becoming invisible uh, because it's it's not necessarily obvious when you go to uh, Amazon that it's AI that are driving those recommendations. Yes, yeah. it's not necessarily obvious when I open Apple Music when they suggest playlists to me that that's all AI driven as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all these kind of things have AI going on in the back end. Um, you know, lots of uh, the the sites we use today, uh, the suggestions of people to follow, 
that's all AI driven, um, mm. you know, all that kind of stuff. So it, it's there increasingly, but increasingly invisibly as well. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that, that's going to continue to be the case for lots of these technologies. Mm -hmm.